Welcome to Process to Perform, helping you harness your potential on the way to greatness. I'm your host, Mike Wall. Thanks, as always, for listening. If you're enjoying, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes or Spotify. And we've started to put down some sample training videos for aspiring athletes and writing some blogs and thoughts down for players, parents, and coaches on natural performance enhancers such as sleep and nutrition in particular. You can find all this information on our Unrivaled Systems blog page or visit our YouTube channel under the same name. Had a great talk with Chargers Pro Bowl center Mike Pouncey last episode. And if you haven't had the chance to hear him speak about mindset, routine, and discipline, I recommend giving it your time. Mike's one of those people you meet who knew exactly what he wanted to do at an early age. He had a great idea of how to get it done. And he manifested his aspirations into reality through passion, conviction, and hard work. And the message, the recipe for success was clear with Mike. When you find something that it is you want to be great at, attack greatness with everything you have. Following the same path as others will only get you to the same destination. Don't be afraid to break out on your own. And many people will never be able to differentiate themselves from the pack because they're not willing to do anything out of their comfort zones. At least one time in your life, everyone should feel the exhilaration of being unique, particularly unique through effort that one has to put in for themselves. Mike was also able to identify the thing that made him special at an early age. And at that point, it didn't really matter what anybody else was doing. He was going to chase that, or chasing greatness, as he said. And we are a creature constantly striving for homeostasis, balance in our lives, be that physiologically, emotionally, or socially. The thought of changing our routines, leaving jobs to go out on our own, or leaving the comfort of our home team doesn't feel right because it doesn't feel safe. We naturally want to be part of the herd. And we celebrate those who go out on their own because they're so few and far between. And working in groups to solve problems is something that makes us human. Going away from that is in some ways against our genetic code. Now the path for success in football is pretty clear in America. Become a good player in high school, get a chance to play in college, and if you're good enough, maybe the NFL will come knocking. But as the money in professional sports begins to mount, players are starting to focus in on one sport earlier and earlier. They're hiring trainers, and they're dedicating outsized amounts of time towards finding the right teams, tournaments, and social media posts that will lead to discovery. Participating in new sports feels like trying to get into college now, but they're starting at 8 years old, 10 years old, 12 years old. And some do this because the kids are focused. That's what they want. Some do it because one sport is all the family can handle. But in the back of everyone's mind somewhere is the feeling that if a young player is skipping a season to try something else out, they will fall too far behind to compete in an acceptable level the next year. I think about it. It's hard not to. I mean, it was easy when I was a kid before internet. Ignorance is bliss sometimes. We had no idea there was a Ronaldo or Ronaldinho in Brazil doing things they were doing at our age. So we just moved on to another sport when the seasons changed because it's easier to switch when everyone else is moving with you. And I'm involved in youth soccer now, and the pathway to highly competitive soccer is not obvious, at least in the United States. Elite soccer is still an enigma for Americans, and boys and girls soccer high school teams aren't considered a part of the pathway. College on the men's side is even less attractive to aspiring young players, and our top women are in an illegal dispute over fair pay with the governing board. The landscape's dramatically shifted for everyone because the United States Soccer Federation has recently disbanded their development academy. Now, this should, in some ways, completely disincentivize many parents from driving hours to and from practice every day. The badging of certain clubs and the pathway to whatever is next is uncertain. We should, we can, focus on what matters most. Quality of coaching, player environment. A good number of our top players have moved to other countries in search of better development, but we're still stuck on this hamster wheel. And why? Because leaving the known, even if it doesn't satisfy, feels better than diving headfirst into the unknown. Sometimes we have to break away from the model. Sometimes we have to stop listening to experts and start listening to common sense. And sometimes the best decisions do fall in line with herd mentality. But it's our responsibility to take an unbiased look at the evidence and make the best decision in every situation. This herd mentality was prevalent in professional football for many years in the form of time. I've met many a coach or manager that viewed daily success on the amount of hours in the building or being the first one there or the last one to leave. Grinding is a part of our culture. It's something about the job that is both resented and celebrated equally. And once you create the conditions in which success is measured in billable hours, 
We tend to gather a lot of insight about a player or coach by how many hours of sleep they're losing out on. But time spent is not equal to time improved. Performance professionals have long talked about dedicated practice as a differentiated model to practice. Reduced time spent with a complete focus on your task is far more valuable than hours spent with reduced focus. Parallel this with any job or business model, we want the best versions of ourselves producing at the highest levels. If that requires one hour or one month, the best version of ourselves must be present to produce the best work, and it's not a factor of time. The examples I've given are people who care deeply about success and are willing to go to great lengths to find success. I mean, these parents and coaches in particular, they should be celebrated for the passion and lengths they will go to to find success that largely is reflected on the actions of others. And I'm an advocate for success at all costs, within societal reason, of course, but there's just too many examples of people breaking away from their comfort levels to find new, better pathways to their goals to keep ignoring them. We look back at the Mike Pouncey interview or Kiko Alonso. These are athletes who stand out because they're the ones who decide what is best for them, for their careers, and then base their actions on those decisions, regardless of what others are doing. You know, there's a reason Tim Ferriss has become a world-famous writer after putting out the four-hour work week, or the corporation's higher efficiency experts every month. We want to change performance to the dominant driver of decisions, but people have a very difficult time getting off the beaten path because it's easier to accept than to be proactive. One idea that's always resonated with me is that if you want to be different, you have to be willing to take a different path. And for me, that means understanding how best your personality allows you to operate under optimal conditions. This is what I call your superpower. Your superpower drives you. It is your perceived source of strength. And perceived is important. We are what we believe ourselves to be if those are reflected in the actions that we take. The mental game is the most important thing you can master. Decades ago, Soviet government ran a test to determine what level of physical versus mental training would improve performance in their Winter Olympic team. They started at 100% physical and 0% and mental, and they worked down 75% physical, 50% physical, and then finally 25% physical and 75% mental. When they were tested a second time, the results suggested that in descending order, the increased mental performance time was the deciding factor. This is in line with another mental training story from the era. Accused of spying for the United States, Natan Sharansky was held in a Soviet prison for nine years. And every day, he just played mental chess with himself. So no chessboard, no pieces, nobody to play against. Every single day, he just sat and played mental chess. He obviously wanted to become a great chess player. And he, at that time, just knew kind of the rules and regulations of the game. But he taught himself how to become a true champion. Reflected in years later, after his release, he got to play Gary Kasparov, a grandmaster world chess champion. He beat Gary Kasparov after nine years playing mental chess in prison. We have this amazing capacity to do good for ourselves if we allow it to surface. Taking pride in a superpower can allow an athlete to control the direction of her development. I took pride in my ability to endure physical stress. I heard a quote when I was a kid from track star Steve Prefontaine, and he had said something to the effect that he can endure more than his competition. And whether it was a mindset or a physical gift, Prefontaine used it as his badge of honor, and he pushed himself in training past where most were willing to go. And that resonated with me. I could embrace the suck. The extra sets, the car pushes, Atlas Stones, staying late after practice to get more reps. I would do that because it fed my hunger to be a top player. And really without knowing it at the time, that was my superpower, my differentiating factor. And same with the guys fighting this weekend. There's a UFC fight tonight for the first time in, in months. Tony Ferguson fighting for the championship in the main event. There's a story about him going shin to shin with his kicks. And most fighters kick to the knee or to the thigh. But Ferguson was going after this guy's shins. Now, shin on shin action, that's painful for both people. And usually you're just trying to hurt the other guy. But he was conducting a live pain tolerance seminar during the fight. He was demonstrating that he could handle it more than his opponent. And many players have different but equally effective motivations. Becoming a film junkie makes sense to those with high recall and analytical personalities. Guys that have maybe lower out power outputs but high work rates, they tend to migrate to training systems that increase their ability to outwork their opposition. Slower players become touch perfectionists and utilize their great vision. And these are born out of an understanding of who you are and what your differentiating factors are. 
embracing them with everything you have to give. It becomes less about time served and more about feeding your desires. When you find that which is to become your superpower, you want to embrace that thing. You want to become the best at that trait because it makes you whole. But you know, this is hard work. I mean, it can mean long hours, enduring physical or mental pain. It can mean sacrifice. It will mean sacrifice. Work ethic means something different now than it did 100 years ago, 50, 20 years ago, especially in the arena of sports. Because players are paid on potential and not output. And let me explain what I mean because most organizations, especially the smart ones, are paying athletes by what they can provide them in the future, not what they've done in the past. But receiving life-changing money, fame, and notoriety is now happening at such an early age One could see how motivations to be great could get lost in the mix. It's very rare you find an athlete at 20 or 21 years old who can deal with all of that and keep focused on fulfilling their potential. That's a big reason why so many players don't make it. Their definition of success is now based on society metrics of money and fame and not internal metrics of performance and professionalism. You think about Babe Ruth, arguably the greatest baseball legend, at least of all time. He was famously making more than the president in the 1930s, back when that actually meant something. He was making about $80,000, and it led to a famous statement by Ruth suggesting that he had had a better year than President Hoover. But Ruth was only making $3,500 a year when he started out in Boston. It was less than that. I think it was $600 a year when he was playing AAA ball. Even adjusted for inflation, that's not a lot of money. So the greatest baseball legend of all time had to earn his outsized salary for, through performance, through hunger and desire. And now rookies are getting multi-million dollar endorsement deals. They're setting up their families for life before they step into the arena. On the one hand, hey, that's great. Any chance you have to provide for your family and take care of your future, you want to celebrate that. But on the other hand, what happens to your hunger when you have everything you ever wanted? And that's why many of our sports heroes weren't top players at the youth level. Guys like LeBron James, they're outliers. I mean, LeBron James, and I'll get killed for saying this by some of my friends, but he's probably the single greatest athlete I've ever seen in any sport. He likely would have been great at anything. Can you imagine him lining up at a tight end or wide receiver in the NFL? Dominate. Absolutely dominate. That combination of size, strength, and power, coordination, it allowed him to dominate on any field of play. To his great credit, LeBron's been the center of attention since middle school, and he's still been able to produce at a superstar level, despite all the distractions that come along with being a superstar. But look around sport. For every LeBron, there's a Tom Brady, a late-round draft pick who had a harder trail to blaze, and there's a thousand kids with that killer word, potential. Potential is one of my least favorite words because potential is used like a crutch or an excuse. Oh, they have so much potential. You want to see them train. How do they treat their teammates? How do they listen to their coaches? Check out their workout log. Potential is what many ways holds our aspiring athletes back. Potential has given them reasons not to stay hungry, develop to their fullest, or embrace the journey. Because potential is what's putting money in their pocket and giving them social media followers. It's a reason to be complacent. When we shower praise and attention, and at some levels money at young athletes, What are we teaching them? And that's why I'm so big on finding your superpower and embracing it. Finding that thing that you can do better than everyone else and chasing it down. Making it the centerpiece of your game. You go down the line. Drew Brees' footwork. Steph Curry's range. Lionel Messi's ability to finish. The greats find what it is about their personality and physical traits that will make them the best, and they double down on them. They become the best at that specific thing and let the rest of their game evolve around their superpower. And this is not the standard model. We want to be well-rounded. And especially at an early age, you need to be well-rounded. Depending on the sport, you have to be a multifaceted player. But that's not what I'm getting at. I'm not at all suggesting that we become one-trick ponies. I'm just suggesting that when we find that thing that we're most passionate about because it separates us from everyone else, we attack that thing. We make that thing the centerpiece of our game. During this isolation period, every athlete out there has been given a unique opportunity to find their superpower. You're not with your team. you got energy to burn. What a great opportunity to think about what it is about you that makes you special, that makes you unique. And I want you to think in terms of mindset. Certainly, aforementioned athletes have unique physical skills, but what separates them is their mindset. 
and embracing who they are by spending whatever time is required to master what makes them special. So think about your relationship with sports or a particular sport. What is it about you that you can exploit to make you even more unique? Do you see the field well? Do you embrace physical challenges better than others? Do you have an underlying hunger to score points? Everyone's different. And sports, especially team sports, are great because everyone has a role to play. And who knows? You might change the way the game's played. Remember when Tiger Woods came on the scene? He started hitting fairway bombs? Watch the new generation. They can all drive par fours now, and that didn't happen by accident. Tiger made everyone realize what was possible. And ultimately, that's the opportunity for all of us. Here's a call to action. Spend some time thinking about what it is about your ability on the field that separates you from everyone else. If you had one particular skill set or one particular physical or mental characteristic, what is it that separates you? Write it down. Think about if that's what you really are passionate about. If those two things meet where ability meets passion, that's your superpower. That's what can separate you from everyone else. Now, what are you going to do to exploit it? Start thinking about that. It's worth the time. All right, that feels like a good time to close it down. This was Process to Perform. Again, if you're enjoying, please subscribe, rate, and review, share with your friends. All right, happy Mother's Day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.